Hi everybody and welcome to chapter two, Travels with My Lamps. Coming to you live-ish, off my iPhone, in my shop. Kind of cold out here this morning, spring in Canada. So uh, I could light a fire or turn the heat on, but I'm too cheap. I want to pass the savings on to you, my customers. So grab yourself a cup of coffee, wrap yourself in a warm blanket, and let's, uh, let's do chapter two. I'm young, I'm wild, I'm free. I've got the magic power of the music in me. Triumph, magic power. I consider myself fortunate that my path in life was programmed into me at a pretty young age. When I was one year old, my mother wrote in my baby book about my fascination for candles and shadows. Somewhere around age five, my parents took me to a Peterborough Pete's hockey game at the local arena. As they tell it, I spent the whole game looking at the roof, the grid, the bright lights, and I wasn't looking down at the rink, couldn't care less about the game. Parents were upset after spending their hard-earned money that I wouldn't look at the ice. Little did they or I know, but that's how I was wired. Pun intended? Uh, I've always been fascinated by it, light that is, and what it can do. I see light everywhere. I see it from the sunlight streaming through the trees. I see it from street lights casting that crappy CRI glow onto our streets. Down to the way candlelight looks on a woman's face. Still the best. With this desire to learn more about light and electricity, I was on my way before I knew it. I was learning the principles that guide my life to this day. I had a wooden workbench in the basement that the grandfather made me. Some things never change. I still have a wooden bench. I started to experiment with electricity, and I'm sure it caused my parents a few sleepless nights as I discovered the fine line between a working project and a puddle of blackened electronics. My first lighting console was a homemade slab of wood with some sketchy wiring and some scavenged switches. At the time, I didn't know about dimmers, relays, so all experiments were conducted with good old 120 volt. Trial and error, hit and miss. At a piece of wood, I'd lay across the arm of a chair and was resting on my lap. I'd get shocks. So I had about a two foot piece of wood, scrap lumber, and I drilled some holes out, put in some switches. I had three regular switches, but I wanted a fourth channel. So my friend Dean Johnson and I scavenged a windshield wiper switch from an AMC Javelin. Now at this point, I was still a little fuzzy on the difference between AC and DC. That switch was from a 12 volt DC car. So it should have pretty much exploded on contact. I still have no idea why that switch never blew up or burned down the house in the several years that I used it. My next addition to the lighting was some bump button. Now I didn't even know what a button was, I didn't know what consoles were, but I knew I wanted to play lights like a keyboard player. I took some Campbell soup tins, cut them into rectangular strips, and after attaching the tin to the board, I ran the hot wire to the bottom and attached the contacting screws so when I hit the piece of metal down, it would make a contact. I had to use a lot of electrical tape, but I got some pretty decent shocks along the way. It was my first experience with carbon buildup, because it would, it would get carbon on the bottom and the connection would get loose and I'd have to take the switch apart, sand it down, put it back together. So now I had the control surface, what am I supposed to control? So I started out that year by stealing people's Christmas light displays. Not my immediate neighbors. Uh, Monica, Linda, the Sneaks, uh, don't worry, I always went like a full block away from our neighborhood. Now I was particularly interested in the 100 watt colored floodlights and the holders. Not the ones with the spikes, the ones with the round base. So you could screw that to a piece of wood and use it as a floor base. Now even then I knew that a hot light on its side can cause a lot of damage. I would then put them behind furniture in the family room and uplight the walls to get spooky shadows and effects. At this point in the story I guess I should apologize to those neighbors. Now the next light board I had came from the most unusual of places. My dad liberated it from his work. It was another homemade contraption, just a whole lot safer than the one I had made. It was a wooden box with three light switches on it and a dimmer. A dimmer! It had a long power lead and four duplex outlets on the back. The first show I lit with it was a fashion show at the Markham Library when I was about 15. Clients lost to the sands of time, but I do remember getting my first write-up in the local newspaper and my first credit as a lighting director. 
I also remember it was my first power failure due to overloading the circuit breaker. Now somewhere around this time, I met a real lighting technician named Alex who was working for Saga. It was my first brush with a real band. Saga had music on the radio. Alex loaned me 2,000 watt par cans to play around with. And after playing with floodlights, these things were the real deal. I'd never seen anything so bright and anything that could heat up so fast. Back in the day, there was a robust market for bands and bars had bands, the Holiday Inn circuit was in full swing and bands could travel from high school to high school to make money and gain fans. The next year, Saga came to our high school and I made my very first money in showbiz. I think as part of the tech crew, we got $10 to load in, set up, see the show, load out. I would have done that shit for nothing but I kept my mouth closed. They came into our gym with some of the most advanced sound and lighting gear any of us had ever seen. They brought in a laser show, which started my lifelong fascination with lasers and special effects. And after seeing that real laser rig, I found a laser in the high school li library and liberated it to add to my burgeoning collection of lights and special effects. Now, one of the first kids I met in high school was Cam Adams. And he lived on a farm on the outskirts of Markham in Box Grove. His parents were pretty liberal. We kind of had the run of the place. We started a band called Jetlag with Cam on bass, Al Higgins on guitar and vocals, and Cliff Mark on drums. Al had only one t-shirt, Adidas. Uh, I, of course, oversaw tech, and we cleaned out a selection of them in the barn, cleaned out a section of the barn, and built our first clubhouse studio. The first songs, Wind Cries Mary, Jimi Hendrix. Back in the USSR, Beatles. Jumpin' Jack Flash, Stones. Cat Scratch Fever, Ted Nugent. And Don't Fear the Reaper, Blue Oyster Cult. Which also started me on a lifelong fascination of getting the lyrics right because I had to take the album needle on the album and go up and down, up and down, up and down to try to figure out what the hell the lyrics are in the middle section of Don't Fear the Reaper. You know, the curtains blew and then he appeared, the candles blew and then disappeared. Man. It took like a week back then. You kids in Google have no idea. So finally, uh, we had enough music. We could play some house parties along the way. So we played a gig at Murray Ackerman's house. And his folks were out of town. Or so we thought. Just as the band was getting going down the basement, Murray's parents came home to find their son passed out under a tree in the front yard and a hundred teenagers dancing in the basement. This was my first experience with the extreme fast loadout under the parental stink eye. Finally, we had enough material to play a gig in our own high school. And at the time, the number one song was Van Halen's Jump. And with that iconic keyboard riff anchoring the entire song, we needed a keyboard player. Enter Sean Brown, who I knew via his parents as we were in Markham Little Theater together. So now that we were local heroes, and I mean local, and by heroes nobody knew us, it was time for our first real gig. Cam's friend Orvin owned a bar called Melodies on O'Connor Avenue. We were all underage. I think I was the oldest of 17. And Cam's mom, Diane, bless you, Diane, uh, loaned us her company car to get the gear there. As part of our deal to play the club, we had to dress up and hand out flyers. We dressed up as big overstuffed animals and basically harassed anyone who got near us. I mean, whoever thought that letting a bunch of stoned teenagers advertise in outfits was a good idea. We got kicked out of the mall at Eglinton Square and scared of a child all throughout the neighborhood. So now, here we are, first gig day, debut in a bar. We go load in, and we had a trainer, four channel head, two column speakers, one guitar amp, one bass amp, and no monitors. And this is where I started to learn and adapt to think outside the box for better or worse. Because we had no drum microphones, or a suitable PA to even run them, I came up with my first brilliant audio idea. Tape a PZM microphone to the drummer's chest. And that way, wherever he pointed and played the kit, the mic was follow him and pick it up. Uh, solid idea, but he had to bring 25 feet of cable with him in the bar all night because I only had enough tape to apply it once. The gig flew by, no time flat, and we were back at some place in Scarborough having a party. We've already had the drugs, we've had the rock and roll, 
What's missing? Sex. Someone had the bright idea to get a hooker. And the next thing I knew, we were all lining up in the hallway. Now, not much to report here. I wish I could spin a better tail, but it was all moving a little fast for me. So, there's the holy trifecta of sex, drugs, and rock and roll on gig number one. I felt like I was really on my way. As you'll find out in later chapters, I discovered very fast that no girls wait around for the crew to load trucks. Talent may get free dope, but crew doesn't. But rock and roll can save your life. Chapter 2, thanks for listening. Brought to you by today's Rush t-shirt. And we'll see you for the next episode. Peace out.